you know what? It's cleaner than clean energy. Me! Because I'm cleaning the clean energy right now. That joke. I'm not one who usually tracks my energy usage, but I've just been given a really hard challenge by the producers. Try sleeping without aircon, only take public transport, and you have to turn off all power sockets before going to sleep. Did I succeed? I'm walking to run some errands, but look at the sky. I need to off everything. I'm feeling a little bit warm, but I guess the fan will do. About 40% of our carbon emissions come from the power sector. That's crazy, right? Since almost everything we do consumes electricity. Under the Singapore Green Plan, one of our goals is to use cleaner and greener energy. And by 2030, we'll generate five times as much solar energy. I'm trying my best to help us reach this goal. Um, I think I have a better way. This is Brendan from HDB. He's an engineer whose team has installed solar panels on the roofs of over 2,700 HDB blocks in Singapore. This is my land! Wow, there are so many solar panels. So why are we putting so many solar panels on rooftops? Well, as you know, Singapore is land scarce. So there's uh, not really any available space that we can have to have large-scale solar farms like those you see in other countries. On rooftops, uh, there's a lot of underutilized space, as you can see over here. It's generally not shaded by any of the surrounding buildings. And what's all this electricity we are capturing kind of used for? Well, the electricity is used to power the common services of this block, such as the lifts, the lights and the water pumps during the day. I see. Then on a day that is raining or cloudy, how? The building services is still connected to the power grid. The building will still draw power from the grid. It's not like when it rains, the lift will go out of service. Like. No, no, definitely not. Everything will still be operational as per normal. With this concept of repurposing available space, aside from HDB rooftops, there are actually other creative spaces to place solar panels. Hi, hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> this is Sharon from SEMCORP and Sijia from PUB. They are part of the team that developed the SEMCORP Tengi Floating Solar Farm, one of the largest inland floating solar farms in the world. Aye, aye, Captain. I thank you. So what is the electricity generated here used for? So our water treatment is actually very energy intensive. So this solar farm can generate over 70 gigawatt hours of energy, which is enough to offset the energy for our five local water treatment plants. So like, why do you all decide to put solar panels on the water body? So the reservoir has a cooling effect on the solar panels, which actually helps to not let them heat up too quickly and actually helps in the electricity generation. This will have minimal adverse impact on the biodiversity in the area as well as the water quality of the reservoir. Wow! Pulau solar panel. Instead of an island filled with grass and greenery, we have an island of solar panels. I don't say bad things. Say bad things here will drop in. Instant karma. <laughs> So what happens is that every one of these are stringed together. So if there's something wrong, they will know exactly which island it is and then they will come and tackle that particular string. Wow! So if there's bird poop on the solar panels, will that kind of uh, obstruct the generation of electricity? Yes, it will. And over time, it may even damage the panel. So if there is bird poop, we will try to clean it. Then how do you clean these solar panels? So that's a good question. Let me show you. Woo! You know what? It's cleaner than clean energy. Me! Because I'm cleaning the clean energy right now. That joke. Now that I know some big actions we're taking as a country, I'm going to visit a family of eco-warriors to find out how you can design your home to be more energy efficient. Hello! Hello! Hi! Nice Hi. to meet you guys. Welcome. Oh my god, your house is very nice. <laughs> Meet Shan and Mahes. They are self-professed environmentalists who do as much as they can to reduce their carbon footprint. 
So how important was it to um, design a home that you know was energy efficient or like carbon efficient? That was at the top of my mind. You don't want to be like a normal people going through the same thing, just throwing the rubbish, wasting plastics. That's why we always bring our own containers to pack yeah. food and all this. So we wanted to apply the same principle when we were also building the house. We wanted to use sustainable materials that will outlast what is generally available. So what tips do you guys have to kind of reduce energy usage? All the lights are LED lights. They consume lesser energy as compared to the normal lights. On a good day, we'll try and open the windows and let the light in or let the wind come in. So when you guys do turn on the aircon, what temperature do you keep it at? We need to keep it to 25 and above and at low fan. Also, all our power points are all very accessible. It's all off at any given time unless we're using it. You know, like personally, I've always thought that individual efforts sometimes a bit questionable la, like whether it really makes a difference. First of all, there are 7 billion people in the world and the world may be a better place if you make the first effort. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, they think that living sustainably is very expensive but it's not going to be that pricey because we know we'll definitely reap the benefits right. in the amount of time that we live here. Most of us don't put in any conscious effort in reducing our energy use. But every effort counts. You know what, I think I'm starting to get a meaning of why I did those energy saving challenges earlier in this video. And with all of us working together, I think we're definitely on our way to achieving our green plan goals.